Okay, we're going to step away from data structures for a while. Um, this week is going to be exceptions on files. And then when we come back from break, we're going to talk about recursion, which is a technique for doing programming. And it's not a data structure in itself, although it fits in really, really well with the data structures that we're going to learn after recursion. So when we get to this chapter on trees and tree algorithms, we're going to really be very glad that we know about what we learned in chapter four. Oh, chapter five doesn't actually do a lot of data structures either. Now that I think about it. Oh, well, it'll be a nice break from all those data structures in chapter three. So everything we've been doing up till now has been with our data in memory. We put it into our program, either from the keyboard or we've had an array or a linked list that we build on the fly. And this is all very wonderful, except when you have to do something like, okay, I have all of the weather data for the maximum temperature for the last 10 years, and I need to find something out about it. Well, you don't want to have to type that all in from the keyboard. You want to be able to just say, here's the file, go read all that data and do stuff with it. So this is why we're going to need files. And to talk about files, I, I would have done files and exceptions, but exceptions normally comes first. So let's do that. And let's start off with this wonderful program here. Let me bring it up here so it's a little bit easier to read. And this can produce three different types of errors, all of them which will. So for example, here, if I enter an index one to three and I type in the word three, I get an input mismatch exception. And by the way, I'm going to write that down because I'm going, to, I'm going to need that information later. Um, let's say I do put in something that is valid here. Uh, let's run it again. And I put in a negative five. Well, that's a valid number, except I say, uh, let's divide that element number by 22 or 12. And you can't have an index of negative five. So there's an array index out of bounds exception. And notice we're using the word exception. So exception is something that exceptional that has happened in your program. Not always something that will crash it, but it's something that you need to take note of that's out of the ordinary. That's why it's called an exception. And finally, we can run it. And the third kind of error is if I have, I want index number two, and I'll divide it by zero. I'll get a division by zero um, arithmetic exception. So those are the th three kinds of errors that I can have in this program. Now, it is possible to use if statements on all of these to get around them. Yeah? There's something on the input on a scan you can ask, has int or has next int. And if it has a next integer, then it's OK to do it. Otherwise, you can put up some error message. And here we could do an if statement to check to see if we got a zero for the divisor. And we could also look at our index to check that it was in between zero and the length of our array. Okay, so we could handle all the possible errors by doing if statements. But we already know how to do that. How, by the way, have y'all, how many of y'all have done exceptions before? Um, okay, good. This is going to be totally new for you all. So we've got array index out of bounds, arithmetic exception. And what we're going to do is we're going to use what's called a try. We're going to try some stuff. And if there's an exception, we're going to catch it. So let's add that. Um, should I say this? say this is a different version? So we have all the versions or not? Oh, OK, fine. Then I'm going to have to save this as. So here we're going to go here. We're going to do try. And that means all of this stuff has to be indented. And then we're going to do a catch. And we're going to look for an arithmetic exception. So this is going to we catch the division by zero. Remember, that was the one that showed up the last time we ran it. And since this is the name of a type, we need to have a variable to hold whatever exception we catch. 
So when an exception happens, we get an object that gives us more information about what went wrong. And by convention, everybody calls it EX. Okay, so I'm going to go with convention. That's one where I'm breaking my rule of having meaningful names. But this is just everybody's doing it. You see every Java program in the universe does it this way. And now what we can say is system.out.println, you can't divide by zero. Okay. Let's compile that and run it. And so if I say index number is two and I divide by zero, it caught that. Now that's the only one that it will catch. If I run this again and I type in CWO for two, I still have my java.util.input mismatch exception. Well, let's get rid of that one also. Let's catch it also. It turns out you can have as many catch clauses as you want with a try. So I can say catch input mismatch exception. And I can, how about spelling it right? And I can give it a name and I can use the same name because these are separate blocks. This variable name EX is local to this block, sort of like parameters are local to a method. So I know that there is no problem naming them all EX. And I'm going to say system.out.print line of please use digits for your um, numbers. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, that is not one of the built-in exceptions. Arithmetic exception belongs to a class called Java. Dot, um, a package, excuse me, called Java.lang. And java.lang is automatically imported for you. This one is not imported automatically, so I have to import it. <laughs> and now when I run this, if I put in a two, please use digits for your numbers. Cool. Um, again, if I could do something like five and zero to two, I get an array index out of bounds exception. This is how you know the names. You have the program crash and it tells you the name right there. Unfortunately, they also happen to be very long names, but there's nothing we can do about that. In fact, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just going to copy and paste that. There, that was, I, I should have thought of that earlier. There we go. And now I can catch array index out of bounds. Is enter a number from zero two plus um, data dot length. Yeah. So I have three catch clauses, and it doesn't matter what order they're in. So now if I have negative five and two, oh, please enter a number from zero to four. Uh, I lied. Subtract one, because that's my lo largest index. So now if I say negative five. Oh, that's interesting. I have to put this in parentheses. Otherwise, order of operations thinks that the minus sign is trying to subtract strings. There we go. That's much better. Now, if I say negative five to zero to three, perfect. Okay. That's the basics of exception catching handling. And of course, I forgot. Unfortunately, I forgot to put this in different versions. Oh, well. Now, there's a hierarchy of exceptions, okay? And they all descend from the class called exception. And here are the ones that you will encounter most often in Java. I mean, there's a ton of these guys out there. Let me just run this over here. Um, okay. 
So these are just the direct known subclasses. Okay, there's a there's a lot of them out there. And even when we get to something like, um, where was it here? Exception. I'm sorry, I have a runtime exception. If we have runtime exception, there's a, an enormous number of those. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong in a Java program. Obviously, I'm not going to go over all of these. Again, these are the most common ones that we're going to see. And those are IO exception and file not found exception. That's what we're going to need when we're working with files. Runtime exception, the basic ones we're going to get is arithmetic exception divide by zero. You can have an illegal argument exception. That means if they give an argument to a method that doesn't expect it, and that will often happen when you have a number format exception. If I'm trying to parse something into an, int uh, into an integer and I give it something that isn't an integer, I'll get a number format exception. Um, illegal format exception is when I use printf and I give it the uh, a format that doesn't exist. And index out of bounds exception, I can have the string index or array index out of bounds and null pointer exception um, is the one where you haven't initialized a reference and has null in it. And this is one of the most common ones that you get when you're playing around with objects. You always want to put them in the correct hierarchy. So for example, if I had here, well, let's go here and, and try and compile this, it'll say, no, array index out of bounds or exception has already been caught because index out of bounds includes this one. That means I have to put them in a different order here. So something other than an array index went out of bounds. And now it'll compile successfully. So if I had a string index that was out of bounds, it would catch it there. Yeah. Now, the question is, what if I do a catch the most ge generic exception possible or one that has many possible causes like file not found exception. There's a lot of things that can cause that. Um, and so the question is, how can I give the users more information than see how high something went wrong? And the answer is here that this exception variable that we have, remember that's an object and this object has methods. And one of the methods is you can get the detailed message string a short description, or you can print the stack trace, which will give you everything that would have happened when the program crashed. Um, let's go here and let's save this as one exception only Java. And let's just catch exception EX. And now what we're going to do is system.out.println of ex.toString, which should give us our short description. System.out.println of ex.getMessage. And this is the detailed description. And then we're going to have system.out. Well, no, 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 no. We ex.printStackTrace. No need to. Uh, put this inside print line. Why? Because it prints things out. In fact, let's, let's make it very clear. And just to show you that the program really isn't crashing, although it looks like it, Mm 
that will show you that it's really not blowing out. It really is catching it and doing something. Okay, so that's compile. Um, yeah, how about changing the name here? By the way, I do not recommend this. Okay, I don't recommend having just uh, catching exception and then you know throwing things up in the air and figuring out. Okay, I'll just put out these messages and hope it works because some of the messages aren't that good. So now if I put in, let's say two. So here's my short, uh, my detailed description. Here's null, which doesn't help much. And there's my full um, description of what went on. And I've talked about how to read these before, haven't, haven't I? Okay. When you get one of these, what you need to do is look for the one that's in your program. Remember, we've talked about stacks, okay? Now, the, hey, now we know what a stack is, hooray. Well, that's what happens when you have methods that call other methods that call other methods. Every time a method calls another method, it remembers where I, where these are called stack frames, and it pushes the new stack frame on top of the old one. Once a method returns, it gets popped off of the stack, and then you return to where you left off from the calling method. So we had a stack trace. This is where it really happened at line 943 of scanner.java. That was called from line 1598, which was called from line 2263, which was called from line 2217, which was called from our program at line 19. So that's how I know where it is. You look for the one that's in your program. Sometimes it'll be the first one. More often than not, it will not be the first one. But look for the first one that's in your program, and that's the that's the place where it really went went off the rails. Let's um, run this again. Put a three and a zero, and now here it gives the name of the exception and divide by zero, and the stack trace. It was immediate. It was on line twenty four. And if we do negative five and two, here's the full description. Here's the short description. And there's our stack trace that gives all of the information that we want. And, and you can sort of mix and match this. Okay, again, don't use just exception all by itself. That's really not good programming style. But if I had had this one here, I might want to be able to use um, some of the output from the exception variable to give more information about it. So I don't have to duplicate that work myself. And then in terms of handling exceptions, Let's finally talk about finally. And, and I see this a lot. Is sometimes you're going to be allocating resources in your try block. Let's say you're opening a file in a try block or you're um, allocating some large amount of memory and you want to make sure it's all cleaned up when you leave. That's what the finally clause does. A finally clause will execute whether the try succeeded or whether it got caught. No matter what happens, the finally clause will always happen. And that's where you can clean up any open files. You can get rid of any resources that have been allocated. If you, let's say you've got a um, connection to the web somewhere and you wanna make sure that connection is closed, whether your program succeeded or failed, that's where you put in the finally clause. And let's see where we are here. And there's no variable for it because there's no, you don't know whether you've had an exception or not. And of course,
So here, if I do something correct, index two divided by four, okay, that always shows up. So there's your finally clause. And coming back to what I said earlier about, remember that we could have handled all of these um, errors ourselves with if statements. Okay, so what is the point of having these exceptions anyway? And that's what we talk about here is, you know, first of all, why, why should we have exceptions if we can handle them by, with if statements? Answer is there are some things that if statements are not going to be able to handle. There are going to be some circumstances where an error occurs and you can't catch it with an if statement, or it is not easily caught, um, especially like when we're doing a connection to a, um, of a file. This, uh, something may, you know, a connection may die in the middle of trying to read something, and we really can't do something other than if statement to handle that. And then the question is, well, why doesn't the Java virtual machine just do something reasonable when it cat comes the exception? There's the problem. What's reasonable? So when you divide by zero, what should you do? Sometimes you may want to crash the program. You really want to get out because zero is going to give you totally bad, bad results. Sometimes you might want to just give an error message on the screen saying, I'm ignoring this data and go on reading the rest of it. Uh, sometimes you might want to put up a message saying, oh, you divided by zero. Um, could you please re-enter that number and let them try again? And those are all three very reasonable things to do. And that's why we can't say what is the thing that Java should do. Does this sort of make sense? And instead, when Java tries to divide by zero or it gets an array index out of bounds, it sort of throws up its hand and says, I don't know what to do. And it throws that exception back to whoever paused it saying, you handle this. You figure out what's reasonable to do and do it. And that's why when I had this in the stack.java, if you try to pop an empty stack, I don't know what the heck to do. Okay, it's like, there are several things I could do. If you're trying to pop in, I could print out an error message. Or I could let the person crash the program. Or I could let them give a warning message and continue on nonetheless. Since I don't know what the person who is using the stack wants to do, I'm going to just throw up my hand and say, you handle it, buddy. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to throw a new no such element exception and I'm going to give a message along with it. And in fact, here, this is the postfix evaluator. So here I'm popping operands, and let's see what happens here. If I give it something valid, three, four, plus five times, it'll give it, but if I say three, four, plus times, and five, and yeah. I'll get an exception, ex no such element exception, stack is empty. Yeah. You can create your own exceptions with their own names. I'm not going to get into that. That's a really tricky bit of business. And I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather not get into that right now. So I just chose one that seemed like a reasonable um, error exception to give. And given that there's so many of them, you'll probably find one that's appropriate for whatever it is that you're doing. And notice, by the way, ah, stack.pop was on line 40, and here was where it first happened. It was on line 67 in postfix evaluator. And sure enough, that is where it was because I couldn't pop that off. Now, what if I want to catch that? Let's go to this save as postfix evaluator with try catch. This is why Java class names tend to get really long. And I'm going to do a try in here.
and I'll catch. Um, what was the name of that exception that I was throwing? It was a java.util.noSuchElement dot no such element exception. How can you tell what things uh, exception something throws? I'll get back to that in a moment. So here I'm going to say try catch. And by the way, you don't have to import something. If I didn't want to say import java.util.blah dot blah de blah, blah, I could give the full name of it here. And then I could say system.out.println of um, don't have two operands for plus whatever my token was. And let's run it. And now if I say three, four plus five times, let's see if that still works. Three, four plus times don't have two operands for star. Now, notice I have here stack.peak of the line 51. So I've got another place that I have to put another try catch on that. Um, let me see where that, that came from. It was line 78. Okay, so let's go, let's go through this stack trace again. Starting at the bottom of the stack, line 105, called postfix eval. And then I blew out here on line 78. So that means here, what I have to say, I have to do a try. Um, And then catch. I'll just return a zero. Um, what am I returning from this? I'm returning an integer, fine. Or I could return null. Um, I don't want to do that, though. And yes, hello. I need a variable name. There we go. And if I run this, now if I say three, four plus times, five, don't have two operands for start. That's interesting, it gave me back the results of the start, but notice it didn't crash out of the program. That was the important part. I did not want it to crash out. What if I do three, four plus times? There is, now that's where I got the stack empty. So this is the nice thing about being able to handle exceptions. You decide what you want to do. Okay, and I decide I didn't. Yes, question? You mean what causes that um, normally? Okay, well, on the stack, okay, if you're trying to pop it and there was nothing there, there is no such element on the stack. That's why I called it that, okay? What normally causes that? That's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Let's go here and let's look up no such element exception. Oh, that's interesting. It, that's the a super class of input mismatch thrown by various accessor methods to indicate that the element being requested does not exist. And that's why I chose that one because it fits perfectly with what I want to do. What's an input mismatch exception? Ah, that's only used in scanners. So the token that they got does not match the pattern or it's out of range. And so whenever you look up one of these exceptions by name, it'll tell you what normally causes it. Uh, so for example, if I want to say index out of bounds exception. And they're taking an index of some sort, array, string, or vector is out of range. And then applications can subclass it to indicate similar exceptions. Um, speaking of which, I'm going to parse int. Remember how we had parse int where you take a string and convert it to an integer? And we, I think I talked about that at some point. Um, when you look this up, it'll tell you what kind of, um, exceptions it throws. 
So the, the documentation in the Java API will always tell you what kind of exceptions can be thrown. If you want to catch them, you can get the exact name of it. And what's the number format exception? Well, let's find out here. Convert a string to one of the numeric types, but the string doesn't have the appropriate format. And let's go back. Just want to check to see if I have anything in the chat. Nope, nothing. Okay. Um, Again, okay, this is going to say, ah, yes, checked and unchecked exceptions. Eh. Anything that is an ex is a descendant of runtime exception, and all the ones that I've used so far are called unchecked. You don't have to use a try and catch. And that's really a good thing, because otherwise, every time you decided to access an array, you need to try and catch, because it could go out of bounds. Every time you tried to convert a uh, string to an integer or a double, you'd have to put a try catch because that could possibly fail. And it would just be ridiculous. Yeah. So they're called unchecked exceptions. You don't have to check them. You can catch them if you want to, like I did with the error prone, but you don't have to. And for most of the runtime exceptions, you can put an if statement of some sort to do it anyway. However, there are some exceptions that can't easily be handled by an if-else, I was saying that earlier, and those are called checked exceptions. And the Java compiler absolutely requires that you put a try or try and catch block around it, or that you have to throw it back to whoever called you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can either catch it or you can throw it and let someone else handle it, but you can't just leave it alone. And the foremost of the checked exceptions is the IO exception when you're doing input and output, and that's what's gonna happen when we are doing files. And so that's what the next topic is. Um, now, the next question is whether I want to talk a little bit about files now. Why don't I start talking about files right now, and I'll go over it again on Wednesday and complete the, the discussion on Wednesday. How's that sound? The assignment for files is not due this week, by the way. I think it's due after break. So what's due this week is the list assignment. Do you need me to go over that again, by the way? Yes, I can. I'll do that um, at the beginning of lab. How's that sound? So we have files. Great. And we've been using a scanner with system.in, but now what happens if I've got a gigantic file with lots of data? And what we need to do is we need to create file objects. So let's go here and let's grab this. Put this in here. And let's put some comments. Normally, the, the reason there no, are no comments in the book, by the way, is because the text of the book is describing it. But since I'm doing this, I want to describe what this is going to do is um, what we're going to do is create a file object which gives you access to interesting information about the file. It does not let you read and write the file. And let's go here. And I think I called this file info.java. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you enter a path name. And that's going to be where to find the file on disk. And then I'm going to say input.nextline. Um you're going to read it into the path name, and I'm going to open a new file object based on that path name. And then I'm going to print it out just to see what we've got here. So path name is, well, why not use um, stack.java? Stack.java happens to be in this 
directory with everything else that I've been doing. So it should tell me, okay, cool. If I want to do that, it says stack.java. Gee, I wonder what would happen if I gave it a non-existent file. Let's uh, say blah.zorko. Yeah. So you can open a file on anything, whether it exists or not. Ooh, that's sort of interesting. So that means we need to be able to do more with this file to find out whether it's a valid file or not, or what kind of a file and what kind of things we can do with that file. And what we have here is F is a file descriptor. Um, in some languages, it's called a descriptor or a file handle. So let's grab all this stuff here and pop this in here. Now that I have a file handle, I can call these methods to find out whether it exists or not. That'll give me back a true or false. I can find out how many bytes the file is. Is it a readable file? Is it a writable file? Can I run this file? Is it an actual program or not? Is this a directory? Is it a plain old file? And is it a hidden file? So all of these things are things that I can um, find out about a file. And let's get rid of that. Let's compile that. And so now let's go to stack.java. It exists. It's 2081 bytes long. I can read and write it. I cannot execute it. Um, it's not a directory. It is a normal file, and it's not hidden. Let's do some other files here. I'm on Linux here, so that I can do all these really interesting things like slash etsy slash password okay you think oh my god you're not going to be able to do anything with that it exists you have the file size you can read it but i can't write it i can't execute it it's a normal file and it's not a hidden file um slash home david dot git config is that what it is oh no it doesn't doesn't exist okay let's try um um, David dot git is true, and notice that's a hidden file. On Linux, anything that begins with a dot is a hidden file. So there's a hidden file. It's a normal one. Um, what if I say slash home slash David slash comma c zero seventy six? It's readable, writable, and executable, and it's a directory. It's not a normal file, yeah. A directory is a folder. Yeah, so it is, is it anything that's a, what you call a folder on Windows is called a directory on Linux and Macintosh. Does Macintosh call it a folder or a directory? They call it a folder? Well, they shouldn't, <laughs> okay. Um, because Mac is actually using a Unix system and they're called direct. They call it folder because that's what everybody's used to. And that's what the icon looks like. But deep down at its heart, it's a directory. Yeah, I don't know, Windows also, it'll tell you directory or not. Uh, is it possible to have something that's not a directory and not a normal file? The answer is actually, actually yes, surprisingly, if I say slash dev slash zero, it's not a directory and it's not a normal file. It's a very special kind of file um, that's reserved for other types of things in Unix. It's one of the weirdest files around. Yeah. But anyway, the idea is now that I have a file descriptor, it's a descriptor. It describes the file. I can call all these methods and figure out what things I can and cannot do once I have this file. And most important, whether it exists or not. That's really important to know. Um, what other things can I find out? Gee, I don't know. Let me look it up. Let's look up file. Um, java.io.file. That's the one I want. I can create new files. I can use a file descriptor to create new files. Um, oh my gosh. I can delete files from a Java program. Ooh, that's interesting. Um, I can get the absolute path name. Oh my God. I got to talk about path names at some point. Do I, do I have to talk about path names? Yeah, talk about passing. Crap. Okay. Uh, um, 
get total space the size of the partition wow usable so there's a whole bunch of stuff here is this an absolute path name or a relative path name it's a hidden file when was it last modified oh that's interesting um yeah i can rename files i can set whether they're readable or not if i have the authority to do it of course, if I try and make like Etsy password writable, it'll tell me no, no, no way you can't do that. And it'll blow out with some sort of exception. Do you want me to try that and see, show, show what happens? Okay, this will be fun. Um, let's save this as make writable. Okay, so this is going to create a file object and try to make it a writable file by calling the set writable so i'm going to enter a path name and then i'm going to say f dot set writable of true and what does this thing return? Does it return anything? Yes, it returns a Boolean. Okay, let's go and look at this. Mm -hmm. Writable, if true sets the access permission false to disallow write up versions, true only if it succeeded. It will fail if you do not have permission. Okay. And if a security manager exists, then it will deny access to the file. Okay, so that's interesting. Let's go back here and um, add that. So we're going to have a Boolean result, is that? And then we're going to say system dot, dot print line of result of trying to make plus path name plus yeah. uh, that's interesting. Cannot find out. Oh. Hi, because I spelled it wrong. I could argue with them about whether the E belongs there or not, but well, info. Oh, yeah. One of us is spelling it wrong. And so now if I say stack.java, it's true because I own that file. Now let's see what happens if I say slash etsy password. Okay, and I didn't have a security manager, so it, it just told me, no, you can't make it writable. You don't have the authority to do it. And um, paths, oy va voy. How am I going to talk about that? Okay. Let me see if I can find this here. Oh, you know what? I may have to do this on the board. Let me try that, okay. Let's go and um, start video. Okay. Find this. Okay. I'm going to do this in a Windows style format because most people are more familiar with Windows. Let's say I have the C drive. And on the C drive, I have a folder called users. And here I have, uh, hmm? is it visible? Okay, great. Um, and let's say we have And then here is a file called um, data.txt. Yeah. Now, there's something called an absolute path. An absolute path is where I tell you everything you need to know to find it. It's as if you were coming in from out of town and you'd never been in San Jose before and you ask, how to get to Gallup, Evergreen Valley College? And I would say, or how do you get, let's say, how do you get to the Gulo building? 
I say, okay, well, first you have to fly into San Jose City Air, San Jose Airport. Then you take a taxi to 3095 Yerba Buena Road. And from there you take um, Paseo de Arboles. Then you get on the footpath and there's Gigolo 2 or Gigolo 1 or Gigolo 2, right? That's an absolute path from the outside world. How do I get to it? And the absolute value is C colon, but then let's put in here another file called um, info dot exe. So this is going to be C backslash users backslash David backslash data dot txt. Now let's say that I'm in info.exe and I want to access this data.txt file. I could use the absolute path name and go all the way from outside, but that's like being here in this building and somebody asks me, hey, how do you get to Gulo 1? I say, well, first you have to go to San Jose's airport. Then you got to take a taxi to 30 minutes. No, she said, it's right over there across the street. Okay? It's in the same directory that I'm in. It's in the same folder. So my relative path. Oops, that's not going to show up there. May I erase this where it says absolute path? So our relative path is just data.txt. I don't have to say anything else. Now, let's make this a little bit more fun. Let's rewrite some of this. Let's have a file here called uh, abc.txt. And here we're going to have, again, David. And here we're going to have def.txt. And we're going to have info.exe. And here, let's, let's make another file here called um, run.exe. These are terrible names, but I just, I'm, I'm making this up as I go along. What if I'm here and I need to use def.txt? What's the path? The, okay, the absolute path would be C users David def.txt. The relative path name, since I'm already in the users folder, my relative path name is David def.txt. Are you okay with that? Remember, I'm in the users folder right now. That's where my program is, run.exe. Agreed? How would I get there? I, what's my path to get there? I have to go into this folder, David, and then... I have a direct shot to def.txt. That's why I'm using that. By the way, on Linux and Unix, you use a forward slash. And you can use a forward slash and it'll still work on Windows, just to let you know. Is everybody okay with that idea? Now, here comes the really tough part, though. What if I'm running info.exe? If I want to get to def.txt, I'm right there. What if I want to get to abc.txt? How am I going to get backwards up to the user's directory? Right now, I'm in David's directory, correct? I need to back up one level. And the way I back up one level is to put dot, dot. So two dots means go back to the directory above me. So that takes me from the David directory up to the user's directory. And from there, it's a straight shot to abc.txt. So that would be my relative path name. Yeah. Now, for those of you who are, for, for, for the assignments we're doing, that's why I'm telling you, put all your data files in the same directory as your program. Then you will not run into this problem. It, 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 it's not going to be an issue. But you do need to know this if you're going to be using um Certainly Macintosh and Linux, and also on Windows, you need to be able to know about this dot dot convention to be able to move upwards and downwards within a hierarchy. Yes. If it's in the same folder, if I'm in info.exe and I want to get to def.txt, all I have to say is def.txt. It's right next door. I don't have to go up and back in. And I'm, there's another way to do it, though. 
You can also say dot backslash D. Dot means my current directory. So go to my current directory, stay here and get to def.txt. Now, why in the hell would you ever want to do that? The answer is there are certain circumstances where you need to say that on Unix or it won't work. Okay. Um, again, I could go into, I don't want to bore you with all the details. But yeah, if, if it's, so I'll tell you what, let me go and share my screen again here. So let's go here and let's make a new LibreOffice writer. And um, I get you. So, so for relative path names, if a file you want is in the same directory as your program, give its name without any other um give its name all by itself if the file you want is in a subdirectory you have to give the subdirectory name and there may be more than one name so for example i may would need to go to david backslash um com sc76 backslash examples backslash um, info.txt if a file you want is in a directory that's in a parent direct in a parent directory or grandparent you have to use dot dot to go up one level so i can say dot dot backslash dot dot backslash xyz dot text that will be in the directory Two levels above where I am. And again, because most of you are Windows people, I'm using a backslash here. But you know what? I'm going to switch it to a slash because that works everywhere. And somewhere, and I don't remember where I put the damn thing, okay? Um, let's see. Finding files. Find, oh, no, no, God, no, that's not it. That is absolutely not it. Um, path names, there it is. Okay. And I have a, a page where you can experiment with path names, where you can try this out. There we go. Excellent. I will I will put this in an, an, an announcement. I'll also put it here in the notes. I knew I had this somewhere. Yeah, so I will upload this with all the example files and um, let's take a 10 minute break and then I will, at the beginning of lab, I will go over the list assignment again. And let me stop recording for the moment. Uh, no, let's pause recording. Okay, real quick, go over and going over this um, unordered list um, assignment. You're going to be adding some methods to the unordered list class. And you're going to start with this one that I give you as your starting point and node. And then what you're going to do is, for example, let's say we have void append item. We'll append a new item to the end of the list. That means you're going to come here 
into your unordered list.java. And somewhere in here, I don't care where you put it. Oops. Let's try and copy and paste that. Copy that. And this will be public. And then here's your code for appending. Okay. So that's going to go into the, into the unordered list.java. It's very important that it goes in that file. You're going to do the similar thing for um, an index method. You're going to have um, something for inserting at a given position in the list and a pop and pop at a given position. And notice, by the way, these will throw exceptions. So if you um, have, and if you give, try to insert at location negative five, it should throw an index out of bounds exception, but you know how to do that now. You can also look at um, things like stack.java to show how, to, that show, shows how it, that happens. So these five, three, four, five, yeah, these five methods are all gonna go into unordered list.java. Then what you're going to do is you're going to have a program called test unordered list.java. And in the main method, you're going to do things with these, this, these methods that you've written. And my strong suggestion, and this was in the um, sample files from last week, we had this test remove all, and I had this utility routine that would make an unordered list out of an array. So I can go here and let's go for test on order list .java. I would paste that in here. And fix the indenting. And then what I can do in here. Tell you what, let me save the, let me save this in the correct directory here. Um, Um, let me say here, um, or you, you can have an, an array of strings. You can have an array of integers. I don't care which one you do. Okay. Any object that you like. And so my list is going to be um, make unordered list from um, numbers. And we may as well take this um, before and after. Well, no, I can't do that because that, that I remember that that was going to lead to problems. Yeah. So. Then I can say my list dot append. Let's say um, so you're going to have the test code there, and you might want to do a system dot out dot print line. Okay, so that would be the first test that you would need to do. Then you're going to append an item to an empty list. So you're going to make an empty unordered list, do an append call to it, and see that it's before and after look correct. And you're going to write a separate set of code to do all of these tests. And there's a lot of them, and this is the, going to be incredibly boring. This is very mechanical work. Okay. This is the part that's going to take a lot of intellectual effort to figure out how to do these correctly. And this is going to be just, okay, now I got to write this test. Now I got to write that test. And yeah, well, we're, we're just sort of stuck with that. Okay. So all of these tests go into the test on order list.java file. 
These five have to go into the unordered list.java file, and you will have to upload both of these to me. You don't need to upload node.java because I already have my code for that. And you don't, don't do not touch node.java. Yeah. Okay. Um, if, if you've changed node.java, then all bets are off. And yeah, how do I know which, when it works? You want to make sure that you don't touch things that other people need, like node.java. So that's the assignment that you should be working on at this point. And I'll talk about the files assignment on Wednesday because that's when we'll know how to do all this other good stuff with files. And let me stop recording.